We got it. All right. So this week, Parshat Shmot, we encounter the figure of Moses. And the question I want to ask is what made him identify as, as a Hebrew? Well, after all, he where did he grow up? In the palace. In the palace. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, let, let's read the verse. Well, I'll, I have an answer when you finish the verse. Yeah. I have my answer. Okay. So uh, we all remember the story. Baby Moses in the, in the Nile and the daughter of Pharaoh rescues him. And then it says, uh, when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. Oh, she first nursed him. Okay. So that stage of his life, he, he, he still, still was with his mother. But then she, Pharaoh's daughter, made him her son. And in the Hebrew, she named him Moses, explaining I drew him out of the water. She named him, she raised him. He is an Egyptian for all, from his perspective, he's an Egyptian. So what, what made him identify as a Hebrew? Here's my answer. The, um, the incident of him encountering the, uh, the two people uh, were fighting, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he and he intervened. Well, it's it's the uh, taskmaster. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 one and one of the Jews said to him, uh, "You know, what are you the Jew? What what are you interfering here?" They, yeah. Uh, well, so well, they said that they knew he was Jewish. He was a Hebrew. They knew he was a yeah. Hebrew. Okay. But so, he was not. He was not self-identifying with them. That was the second incident. But first, oh, the second. Yeah, okay. the first incident, let's call it intervention one. So three okay. times he intervened in some form of, of, of injustice or quarrel or, or um, let's call it a, um, a crisis. So the first one was, uh, this is how the Torah describes it in chapter 2, verse 11. Do I have a volunteer to read it? You have to we, don't, we don't see it. Oh, you don't see it. Wait. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait. No. Okay. Not yet. No. We had it and then yeah. we lost. Okay. All right. I'll after some time Moses grew and went out to his brothers and looked upon their burdens. He saw an Egyptian man strike a Hebrew man of his brothers. Who are his brothers? Okay, that's my question to you. We, we have this phrase in this verse. It appears twice. Who, who are these brothers? Let me say that when there are adoptions in this country, it's very common for the adoptive parents to let the child know that they're adopted so it's very possible that since everybody knew that the pharaoh's sister didn't give birth to him um and who would be floating in the water with with a hebrew uh, blanket on him um it was common knowledge in the palace that this was not an egyptian that this um uh, woman was bringing up as her own child. I'm sure that everybody in the palace never let him forget it. That's a possibility. Um, although, um, especially you bring up adopted kids, usually the parents want to make them, don't want to remind them they're from China or from Russia. They actually want to make them feel part of the family. They want to feel them American. I, the ones that I know here, um, you know, they grew up as Americans, felt Americans, uh, yeah, maybe the parents come at one certain point in their life and tell them, but um, I think that the first brothers is different than the second brothers. And this is a very interesting theory because first when I read this verse for many years, I thought his brothers are the Hebrews, but not, not so fast because when he goes out, he is fully Egyptian in his own eyes and his brothers could mean his Egyptian brothers. But what but the next it follows and, Shammai and looked upon their burdens. Oh, oh so I want to talk about that word. Their burdens, exactly. Who's there? Yes. Oh, what's oh. 
Okay, perfect. So our next slide is that verse, that, that, that phrase, Vayar Besivlotam. You see the Sivlotam. And Professor Jonathan Magonet in his article refers us, that's not the first time the word Besivlotam appears in their burdens. He saw their burdens. He takes us back to his Egyptian brother. earlier in the story. Their burdens, when he talks about how they were enslaved, how Pharaoh started the whole bondage, it says, um, so they set taskmasters over him to afflict him. This is all him. They, they refer to Israelites as a singular. Okay. So that's, that's right. That's Israel over him to afflict ah, him. Ah, their burdens. Their burden. Oh, it's the Egyptian burdens. In other words, okay. the Egyptians, their burdens was the, the, the weight of having to build garrisons. And so instead of ha them having building it, now they're giving it to the slaves, to the Israelite slaves. It transferred the tail. Okay. Yeah. So hmm. earlier in the story, Besivlotam, their burdens, it almost clearly refers to the Egyptian burdens there. Um, and so now when it appears again in this story, do you see the words? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He saw their burdens, their Egyptian. He wants to see what his Egyptian brothers. What, what's their burdens? What, what, what is it that they have to build now? Okay, so the first brothers, the first Vayetzeh Lechav in red, that's his Egyptian brothers. He, he totally identifies, self-identifies as an Egyptian. But then he sees that, here's the picture of what he sees. Here's the visual. Somebody took a picture of it. And he, <laughs> he sees a taskmaster beating, fatally beating uh, a Hebrew slave, and he decides to intervene. So now the second brothers, wait, let's go back to the brothers, to the verse with the brothers. He saw an Egyptian man. Do you see the verse? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now the second one, clearly a Hebrew man of his brothers. So the brothers modifies the Hebrew man. So that's clearly Hebrew. Okay. So look, look at the transformation that happened. The first brothers, uh, he was an Egyptian. And then the second time the brothers appears, now he already feels uh, that he's part of the Hebrews. Or maybe he's, he doesn't know yet, but he, he, he sees this injustice and that triggers something in him. He says, this can't be right. I want to help the people who are being oppressed. It's Even amazing. Then, what? It's it's hard for me to accept the transformation in two sentences. I, but of course, yeah, of course, we, we know Torah is not an exact yeah, history, right. you know. Yeah, it, it, I admit it's a little hard to accept that, but I think he has he has a very interesting point here. Um, and he actually found Ibn Ezra that uh, says something very, very similar. So what does the Ibn Ezra say? He went out to his brothers, Echav, the Egyptians. This is a quote from Ibn Ezra, because he was in the palace of the king. That's what we were talking about. He grew up part of royalty, Egyptian royalty. His Egyptians are his brothers. And he wants to go see the burdens of the Egyptians. Okay. Then, the Ibn Ezra continues, and the meaning of, of his brothers afterwards, a second time, refers to the Hebrews of his family. So, now we're starting to get a glimpse of what, what is it that makes him start to identify with his brothers, the Hebrew brothers. And I, I drew a, a diagram to, to show it. It's really that he felt completely at home with the Egyptians. He saw an injustice. And now he goes and intervenes and he's now, the, the Hebrews are his brothers. So. Why did jump? Like what? He's, he sees one Egyptian doing wrong and suddenly he puts away his 
self-identification and becomes one with the oppressed. It's a big jump. Ah, okay. But it doesn't happen overnight because we'll see that he's not sure of it and it takes a while until he completely, completely identifies with the Hebrews. Because now let's go into the nitty gritty of his action, of the action that he took, of the verse that describes how he uh, smote the, the, the Egyptian. So let's move, uh, let's, let's, let's see his reaction. Right? He decides to intervene. How does the Torah describe it? He turns this way and that, seeing no man around. He struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. It doesn't sound like a royal would be doing something like that. A royal would just strike him down and walk away happily because he's in charge. Oh, right. And so uh, he's, he's afraid. But we don't even know yet he's afraid. That we're going to see later. But here I want to focus on the word Vayalki and Ish, on, on those words. So um, in the JPS translation, they, they skip the word Ish. I want to show you. So the Hebrew has so many intricacies that you can easily uh, miss it if you if you, you can gloss over it. So look, the, the, the JPS translation, I'm sharing it with you now. Uh, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kingsmen. But that's not exact Hebrew. Look, look at the Hebrew. Vayal ish mitzri, an Egyptian man. Make ish ivri, a Hebrew man. And then vayif en kovacho vayaki en ish. Ish is a key word here in this whole episode, right? Ish, ish, ish. And it gets lost. This translation doesn't have it. So I told you about the translation of Professor Everett Fox. And he actually, he keeps all that ish. So I love his translation. He went out and saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brothers. He turned this way and that way and seeing that there was no man. So you see, he keeps the flavor of the Hebrew so well. And that tells us that we need to focus on that ish. What is that ish that he didn't see? He didn't see. So what's the general explanation of it? That he did, what, what, what does that mean that he didn't see any, any man? How do, you, how do you understand that? There were no witnesses. He was, afraid, he, he was afraid to do it. And he did it because he didn't see any, any person who might punish him. Right. That, that's the common explanation. But uh, we're going to see that there's uh, two other explanations of this and ish. Because uh, Natalie's right. Why does, he, why does he have to be afraid? He's, he's royalty. Why, why? So, so people will see him. I mean, he has the protection of the palace. Well, so, I, I would yeah. add a, a different view. This work was sanctioned by royal decree. Yeah. That Egyptian taskmaster was an official, acting in an official capacity. Right. So uh, he, you wouldn't lightly undo it. You, know, you wouldn't lightly interfere, even if you were an, uh, an official uh, yourself, like, you know, Moshe was from the palace. Right. And Natalie's right. He had a lot of uh, authority. Oh, yes. A, a lot of weight. But the, the, uh, the taskmaster was uh, fulfilling a, a direct decree from Pharaoh. Right. But and that and that that strikes pun intended, strikes Moses as something very unjust, very unfair, something that his Egyptian brother should not be doing. And so this brought our, our two of our commentators to explain this Ki'en Ish in a different way. And my great aunt Nechama brought two Achronim, two Achronim, when I say Achronim, meaning 19th century commentators who explained this Ish in two different ways. What is it that he didn't see an Ish uh, around him. So let's see the first one. Do you see the picture of the Nazim from Volozhin? Yes. Yeah, Volozhin, yeah. Yeah. So let's read. Uh, any volunteer to read what Volozhin explains? Let us see. He turned here and there. Quote, Moses sought to find a way to bring the Egyptian to justice for his criminal and inexcusable conduct. Quote, he saw that there was no man, quote, to whom he could appeal for justice since they were all treacherous and enemies of Israel. Ah. Ah. 
Very interesting explanation. And Ish, there's no one acting like an Ish in the Egyptian system. They're all part of this gang of oppressors. There's no, there's no real man there. A man of, there's no man of justice. So he has to take the matters into his own hands. That's how he understands Ish. He's so, and you know what he's speaking of? That's he lived, interesting. Remember, he lived in Volozhin, he's the Russian oppressors. He's saying all these Russians, they're all the same. They're all doing right. this, right? He right. was during the time of that we talked about it in one of our previous lessons. What is it called? They um when they drafted the kids, the terrible thing that uh what was it called? The, the um, I, I forgot the cantonment. Cantonist. Cantonment. Cantonist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cantonist, they kept right? him for 25 years, 30 years or so that it seems saw that he, it happened during his lifetime. And you can see in between the lines, he's saying they're all like that. All these Russian authorities, we can't appeal to their sense of justice or or to any court there because they're all they're all corrupt. They're all anti-Semitic. You, you, you hear it in between the lines, right? He's speaking of his own time, and that's how he interprets this Bayalki and Ish. He says, Moses Very saw, there's no point for him to go to complain to, to the ombudsman in Egypt, because they're all treacherous. They're all Jew haters or Hebrew haters. So therefore, he needs to act. Okay, beautiful explanation by the Nazim from Voloji. On the other hand, on the hey. other hand, it was a, a Hebrew slave who, um, a little further down in the Torah, says to him, I but, saw what you did. Right. And um, and then Moses knew that a Hebrew had seen what he did, and therefore um, he, was, he had to run away. Right. So the Hebrew slave did not see him as okay. a Hebrew. Right. So... Um, Rabbi Yaakov Mecklenburg, he explains the Bayal Ki Ein Ish, that there was no Ish there, no man, in a different way. He saw, uh, any volunteer to read Mecklenburg? He turned hey. here and there. That's, that's how he translates that. Yeah. Moses thought that one of his brothers, the Hebrews, who were standing around him, would rise against the Egyptian and save his stricken brother from being beaten to death. Ah, quote, and he saw there was no man. We, we mean by this, he saw that there was no heroic figure among them and none of them paid attention to the suffering of his brothers to try to save him. So, aha, so what this is saying is Moses took the initiative. There was nobody else. Yeah, so now who he, is the... So according to Mecklenburg, Robert Mecklenburg, who is the Ish? Who is the uh, that there was no Ish? Another Hebrew. Another Hebrew, exactly. Who should have intervened. So, yeah. Right. So two. Right. Two but Jones, right. If any Hebrew intervened, he would have been killed. But Right. Right. Yes. He, he saw that they, right. He, he doesn't blame them, but he just saw that the, the fact is they're all so oppressed, so afraid. So that afraid. None of them yes, can, right. come, can come to the aid of their brothers, the, the brother who's being beaten to death. So another thought here that is uh, it's kind of anachronistic, but this <clears throat> explanation of the phrase in Ish is reminiscent a bit of in Pirkei Avod. I believe it says what? Oh, beautiful. There's no man. Yes. Be, be a man. Beautiful explanation. So, and that was part of the article of, Rab, of Professor uh, Magnet. Uh, he brought that quote, Charlie. He brought it, and he oh, said, okay. this is the same theme. Exactly. There's no, the makom she'ein anashim, and the place where there's no men strive to be a man. And so, whether you take it from the Nasiv angle, there was no Egyptian way to do justice here. The, all the Egyptian courts were part of this corrupt culture of oppression. Or whether you take it from the Mecklenburg's way, there was no Hebrew ish to come and save his brother. Whether you go this way or that way, there was no man, and so he had to do the job. Okay, that was intervention <laughs> one. Now let's move to intervention number two. And you have a picture. Can you tell me what it is? <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious. Yes, he's yes. intervening. <laughs> yeah, and what are this? These are the two Hebrews that are fighting, right? The next day. Now, he thought that, that the, the, all the Hebrews would be grateful to him. He thought that after he saved one of them, that they would all be on his side, keep his secret. But guess what? That's not what happened. And so uh, let's read what happened on the next day. Any volunteer?
okay. went out on the following day, and behold, two men, Hebrews, were fighting. And he, Moshe, said to the guilty one, I don't know what the guilty one is, why are you striking your neighbor? Okay. And then the guilty one said, who placed you as a man who is a lord and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me just as you killed the Egyptian? And Moses said, uh-oh. And Moses was afraid and said, yeah. surely the matter is known. It's on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> it's on YouTube, exactly. So even the people that he saved, at least one of them, is now saying, oh, we're, we're going to tell on you. We know, we're not, you, you, the, he feels, can, can you imagine Moses feeling now? He saved them, and now he's being betrayed by one of them. So he said, okay, I can't stay here anymore, right? And then he fled to Midian. So the, the he, he must have mixed feelings now. He saw the oppression by the Egyptian taskmasters. He helped the Hebrew, but then, Here's how they react when all he's doing, trying to do is make, to, to prevent one Hebrew from beating up another Hebrew, from bullying another Hebrew. Okay, he wasn't beating him to death, but he was probably just bullying him. Uh, it says make, make shivri, so hitting him, right? And so the, the, the surprise here is that he can't trust the Hebrews either. And so... Um, you would think that this would lead him to stop intervening, right? He, he intervenes against the Egyptians for the sake of the Hebrews. Then he intervenes with the Hebrews, but they, they turn against him. So you would think that any reasonable person would say, okay, maybe I shouldn't be the policeman of the world. I should stop intervening. But that's not what happens. He flees to Midian and he intervenes again. And here's a picture of intervention number three. What is it? With the men bullying the women. Ah, very good. So here is the daughters of Jethro, the seven daughters of Jethro, and Moses with the red cape. Uh, oh, oh, wait, first, they were being bullied by the Midianite shepherds, men shepherds. And Moses comes and intervenes and saves them, rescues them, allows them to draw the water. Let's read it. Any volunteers to read? Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But shepherds came and drove them off. Moses rose to their defense and he watered their flock. So here it was not Hebrews, not Egyptians. He has no beef in this fight, yet he still intervenes. His sense of justice and fairness is so great that he won't allow this to happen. He, he's a stranger in that land. Remember, he, he's really Egyptian. Uh, yet he can't stand the fact that these Midianite men shepherds are bullying the Midianite uh, women shepherds and he, and he rises to their defense. And, and then he gets... Uh, he marries one of the daughters, right, Sipora, and then he gets to the burning bush and he gets chosen by Hashem to lead the people. But let's go back, we have a few more minutes, to the two Hebrews that were fighting. I, I want to ask a question, who were these two Hebrews? Okay. So, the Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Oh, no, what am I doing? Sorry. I didn't want that. I wanted to show you this. The Torah doesn't say who they were, but there's a Targum uh, that's the correct name was Targum Yerushalmi, but it was 
uh, misattributed to some Jonathan. So today the scholars call it Targum Pseudo Jonathan. That's, that's how it's usually referred to in articles <laughs> and in academic writing. Um, as opposed to the Targum from Babylonia, Targum Onculus. So um, here's, uh, it's kind of based on a midrash. So anybody want to read it? Moses went out on the second day and looked, and Dothan and Abiram, Jewish men, were fighting. When he saw that Dothan was stretching out his hand to Abiram to strike him, he said to him, why are you striking your fellow? So who are these two people? Well, I who? think this, is, this, is a, this was an ex post facto thing because we know Dothan was one of the uh, rebels against ah, Moses right. yeah. and his brother Aaron. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and, and if you saw the movie, you know, you, you saw who played Dothan. Uh, Edward G. Robinson, the, the villain, <laughs> played Dothan oh, in the God. movie. Right. But yeah. uh, so, so I think this was cure. right. I think this was an ex post facto thing because Torah establishes definitely the Dothan was bad guy. So this Targum did an ex post facto. They moved him forward in history and made right. him the bad guy in yeah. this fight. Already in Egypt, okay. he was a bad guy. Yes. Yes. Right. Even, oh. yes. Even before the whole Exodus. The thing. whole Exodus. Already he right. was complaining and. There is a nice linguistic connection. So it's not a pshat, but there is a nice linguistic connection that I want to explore. Okay. So in the Korach Rebellion, do you see this slide now? Yes, yes. yes. They, they, this is in the book of Bamidbar, right? In Numbers. Right. Um, they taunt him, and one of their phrases is, Ki aleinu gam Will you also, like a lord, lord it over us? Okay. Now, ah, now, ah. Back in Egypt, what was the phrase that he used against Moses? Mi samcha leish sal v'shofet aleinu. Yeah. Who placed you so, as a man who is a lord and judge over us? Do you see the connection? Lord yes. and lord. So maybe based on this linguistic connection, same verb. Uh, this is just a different binyan. The, the first one is binyan hitpael, tistarer. So, so they're, they're, that's why the tough is added and the rage is doubled, but it's basically the root is... The same, same root? Oh, that right. tough is an infix. It's an infix. Yeah, it's an infix. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the first tough is just the future tense and the right. middle tough is just the, 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 the infix from the category hit pael verbs. But it's, so it's the sin and the rage, sa, which is... Uh, oh, well, uh, that definitely uh, Lord, is the one. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> maybe based on this, that already in Egypt, they were saying, who are you? Uh, that you are lording, who are you to be a lord and a judge over us and start and start saying you are guilty and stop hitting your brother and so on and so forth. And then they continued it in the desert. And it, this became a Hebrew uh, idiom. This, this phrase here, that would be, I want to show it to you in um, modern Hebrew, you're modern not Hebrew. my boss. You're not my boss. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I want to show you. Yeah, it's in Wiki Dictionary here. Let me show you. Uh, it's beautiful how these biblical idioms become part of modern Hebrew idioms. So I'm going to uh, Wikipedia, uh, Wiki, it's called Wiki Dictionary, Wiki Milon. Do you see Wiki Milon? Yeah. yeah. Wiki Milon, yes. There it is. Mi samcha ish sal v'shofet alein, right? That's what the Hebrew said to Moses. And then it explains here, this is an expression when you are objecting to someone who's taking authority over you and intervening. In, in, uh, and, and here in English, it even says here, Anglit, who put you in charge? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. So, so. Uh, or who, who died and made you king? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Say, yeah. Kids yeah. say that. Oh, Shemai, can I ask you a, a, another linguistic question? Yeah. So sevel, it's translated as burden, but in modern Hebrew, I think it's suffering. Isn't suffering, it? right? It has two so, meanings. So, yeah. So, oh, 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 oh yeah. in modern Hebrew, it also. I thought in modern old would be. No? Yeah. No, no, it has two meanings. Yeah, and okay. savlanut is patience because you have you have to have patience to do to to the burdens, right? It's connected. It's all connected to the same root, but it branched out into 
Yeah, it's a different meaning. So, so in modern Hebrew, seven is not only uh, uh, suffering, but it's also burden. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, no. Modern Hebrew would be suffering. Yeah. So, okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So, so he was a bad, uh, he, so, he, so this guy, let's say he was Dothan, or maybe he wasn't, but he was, uh, he, he basically said, I'm going to betray you, Moses. He was a bad guy, but he gave us a, a phrase that we can still use today. <laughs> Who put you in charge, right? Very good. So when somebody intervenes, meddles with your business, you can say that to them. Okay. okay. When, when you think it's not their place. I mean, sometimes it, 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 sometimes it is right for people to intervene. And I think that's, to summarize, that's what um, we can learn from, from uh, Moshe, that uh, his sense of injustice uh, and, and his felt the duty to intervene and bring about justice was so strong that we saw it happening in three different scenarios. In intervention one, when it was the taskmaster, and he still maybe felt an Egyptian then, but he said, my, my Egyptian brothers can't behave like this. This is terrible. I'm going to stop this. <laughs> then intervention two, when, when he already starts to feel identified, to start to identify. I think you guys are right. It's a process. He starts to identify with them and he says, my brothers, my brothers Hebrews should not be acting this way one towards the other. So he intervenes. Then he flees to Midian and he intervenes in a completely, in a, in a quarrel that's completely not his. He has no beef in it whatsoever, yet he still uh, intervenes. And that reminds me, I'm going to end with a short quote. Who is the famous, famous leader who said that we should, that we should be care about injustice everywhere? What famous statement does it bring to mind? Probably Martin Luther King. Is my oh, guess. thank you, Natalie. So I want to show it to you and end with this. So let's watch him say, say it in a speech. I found it on YouTube. Stick to civil rights. I have another answer. Others can do what they want to do. That's their business. Other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I'm a saying that I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 